If you brought a Bible, I'd like you to turn with me over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We are going to be looking at a lot of Scripture today, a lot of reading, so I hope you're good with that. It'll, if you didn't bring a Bible, the verses will be projected on the screen. And so you just want to keep that in mind as we go through, because we want to show from the Word of God that, in fact, Jesus did come back from the dead. And this is something you not only should believe, but you need to believe because there's eternal consequences to it. I've entitled this today, Attention All Skeptics, Jesus Christ is Alive. You know, over time, folks, over these thousands, a couple thousand years since Jesus was here, there have been many attempts to, ex- to try to explain away the resurrection of Christ by those who would be willfully blind. There are people willfully blind. It takes more faith to believe the false theories against the resurrection than it does to believe the facts of the resurrection. And they are facts. There's no question about it. Now, I want you to see uh, here in 1 Corinthians 15, which is where we're going to begin, notice the wording carefully, because it is very, very important. It says in verse 3, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures." might say, okay, but it's not just a statement, because watch what happens now. Verse 5, and that he was seen by Cephas, which is Peter, then of the twelve, he was seen of the twelve. After that, he was seen of over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. In other words, Paul is saying, uh, there are those who saw him physically, and you can go talk to them now, they're still with us, and talk to them about the experience. It says some are fallen asleep. That's like some of you are kind of on your way this morning there. No. (laughs) Um, Fallen asleep, that is a term used for believers who have died to go home to be with the Lord. Verse 7, after that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as, as of one born out of due time. What does the Bible tells us? tell us? He was seen after he came back from the dead. He was seen. He was seen. He was seen. Now, some people say, well, they just, you know, it's a wishful thinking. They had an hallucination, all that. Over 500 at once? If you are an honest skeptic, you will not be a skeptic for long. Because the record is absolutely foolproof. Many world-renowned investigative lawyers over the years have looked into the resurrection and have said that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is an irrefutable fact of history. Thomas Arnold, former professor of history at Rugby and Oxford Universities, one of the world's great historians, said this, and I quote, I know of no one fact in the history of mankind which is proved by better fuller evidence of every sort to the understanding of a fair inquirer than the great sign which God hath given us that Christ died and rose again from the dead, unquote. And yet many have refused to accept the evidence and instead have come up with false and can I say even foolish theories about the body of Jesus Christ. That's unfortunate because the evidence is staggering for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, we're going to look at some of the false arguments against the resurrection today, and then we're going to let the biblical record answer those things, okay? So let's look at some of the false arguments against the resurrection. The first one is this, and this is probably one of the most popular of all. 
It is called the swoon theory. Have you ever heard of it? How many of you ever heard of the swoon theory? Okay. It is called the swoon theory. It states that Jesus Christ was only unconscious on the cross. As a matter of fact, some have gone to the extent some have gone to the extent of saying that the reason he was unconscious is that somebody gave him a drug. Do you believe that? I mean, people have amazing imaginations, don't they? That Jesus was only unconscious and later revived, okay? Now, folks, if you read the biblical record and, in fact, even non-biblical record, Jesus was brutally tortured before he ever got nailed to the cross. So what are some of the answers to this swoon theory? Well, let me, let me give you some. Turn with me over to John chapter 19. John chapter 19. Well, he just, he, he passed out. He was, he was exhausted. He was tortured, yes. He was brutalized, yes. But he just passed out. But he really didn't die, okay? Well, let's answer that. First thing I want to mention is this. The Roman soldiers did not break the legs of Jesus. Do you know why? Because they knew he was already dead. They knew he was already dead. They broke the legs of the other, or or the two thieves on either side, but they did not break the legs of Jesus because they knew he was dead. By the way, remember this. Romans were experts at killing Okay? In John chapter 19, verse 32, then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, these guys knew what death looked like. They break not his legs, but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith there came out blood and water. Our second answer to the swoon theory is this. Blood and water came out of his side when it was pierced. And folks, that is a sure sign of physical death. It is proof that the heart had stopped working. When this takes place, everything is stopped and therefore it's not being mixed up any longer. Third, a Roman soldier told Pilate that Jesus was dead. Look with me over to Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15. So he didn't just swoon on the cross. He had actually died, and we are seeing reasons why we know that to be true here in the biblical record. Now, you know, it's so funny. Isn't this just the world in which we live? Well, that's what the Bible says. (laughs) Yeah? Are you going to believe the National Enquirer over the Bible? You see what I'm saying? Folks, uh, something something smells fishy when, when the biblical record is thrown out for anything else except the biblical record. That tells you there's a bias there. That tells you that people aren't being honest about the situation. No, as we progress through, you'll see why the biblical record is such an important record and proof of the resurrection. A Roman soldier told Pilate that Jesus was dead, Mark 15, verse 44, and Pilate marveled if he were already dead, says he's dead already, and calling unto him the centurion He asked him whether he had been any while dead, verse 45. Is he really dead, verse 45? And when he knew it, do you see that? Of the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph, which leads us to our next sub-point or answer is this. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus wrapped Jesus' body and placed it in a tomb. Now, folks, listen. If he wasn't dead, they would have made him dead when they wrapped his body. They would have covered his head. 
they would have wrapped his body, okay? He would have suffocated if he wasn't dead. Now he was dead. But if you look at this, you realize how foolish it is to say he wasn't really dead. No one knew better than they did that he was dead. They spent, Joseph and Nicodemus, they spent more time with the body than anyone else. How do you have a dead body, a corpse, for a long period of time, hours of time, and you don't know if the person's really dead or not? It's just foolish to think that he didn't really die. Remember, it was Joseph's tomb. Here we have it written about in John 19, verse 38. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. Okay, you can do that. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. So all this time, the body of Jesus is there, dead. And so he goes and he's asking for the body. The body's already dead. He goes and gets the body. They take the body away, and then they start preparing the body for burial. And you tell me he's not dead? It's silly. Then they took, um, let's see here, verse 39. And there came also Nicodemus, which at first came to Jesus by night, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices, as the manner of the Jews is to Barry. All right? Go with me to Matthew chapter 27. One verse I want you to see as we uh, track this issue. Matthew 27, in verse 60. And here it's talking about Joseph of Arimathea. And it says in verse 60, and laid it in his own new tomb the tomb belonged to Joseph, which he had hewn out of the rock, and he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. All right? Well, I still don't believe that. uh, I still don't believe Jesus died. He swooned, and then while he was in the tomb, he recovered, being completely wrapped up, even his face, even his nose, even his mouth, I mean, do you believe people believe that he didn't really die? Our next point is this. It would be physically impossible for a man they thought was dead to have revived on his own without aid. The late Dr. Henry Morris said this, quote, How in his weakened condition he managed to disengage himself from the great weight of wrappings and ointments, then break the Roman seal, roll away the giant stone at the entrance, overpower or elude the Roman soldiers, and then search out the disciples, unquote. It's just ridiculous. The swoon theory is ridiculous, okay? Let's look at our second false theory. It is this. Now, now listen, I understand some people are directionally challenged. Anyways, let's move on. (laughs) Number two, the women made a mistake and went to the wrong tomb. How about that one? Well, let's answer that. The first thing is this, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joses, saw Jesus placed in the tomb. All right? Look over, you're in Matthew, look over in chapter 27, Matthew 27 and verse 59. It says, and when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock, and he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed, and there, there, was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulcher. 
Now, you don't have to turn there unless, you're, unless you want to, but in Mark chapter 15, a parallel passage with this, it says in verse 47, And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, beheld where he was laid. They knew where he was. They knew the tomb in which he was put. Folks, this is a traumatic experience for these people. It wasn't something that, uh, you know, it wasn't like, okay, there's, there's 50 tombs that look exactly alike. You know, sort of like a storage units where they all look alike and you just choose the one. Oh, they picked the wrong storage unit. No. This was a unique tomb. One of a kind. One of a kind. Not only that, but secondly, on Sunday morning, Peter and John also went to the same tomb. The wrong tomb? Oh, Mary got it wrong? And then Peter and John got it wrong? They went to the wrong tomb? No, no I, don't, I don't think so. Were they also mistaken? Well, let, let's look at the record here. Turn with me over to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. You see, friends, Jesus literally, physically, came back from the dead. And we have a responsibility to respond to him properly with that. In John chapter 20 and verse 3, here it is, uh, John's uh, account of the resurrection. It says, Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, John referring to himself, John is writing, he never gave him his own name. The other disciple, or he'll talk about he, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher. You notice it doesn't say a sepulcher? The sepulcher. So they ran both together and the other disciple did outrun Peter <laughs> and came first to the sepulcher. Don't you love the Holy Spirit and his inspiration? You know, God breathed. God gave him the words. I don't know if John said to the Lord, Lord, can I put down that I outran Peter just to get it in there? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Now I'm... But don't you think that's interesting? He made it a point to let you know that he outran Peter. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Now, wait a minute. If this is the wrong tomb, why are the linen clothes in there? It's the same tomb, by the way. And he, stooping down, looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes lie and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple which came first to the sepulcher and he saw and believed." For as yet they knew not or understood not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Not only that, but remember this idea, well, they went to the wrong tomb. Let's give another reason why it was the right tomb. It is this. Was the angel at the wrong tomb also? Think about it. Let's go over to Matthew chapter 28. Let's let God's word answer this. Matthew chapter 28. So the angel rolled away the stone. Was it the wrong tomb that he rolled away the stone on? Matthew 28, verse 5, And the angel answered and said unto the woman, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified, he is not here, he is not here, but is risen, okay? Come see the place where the Lord lay. Come see the place where the Lord lay. The angel is saying, and by the way, in, uh, we, I don't have it listed here, but in chapter 28, verse 2, 
it talks about he rolled away the stone. Here's the point. Come see the place where the Lord lay. This is not the wrong tomb. This is the right tomb. It's very clear. Let's look at another false theory on the body of Jesus Christ. The third one is this. Unknown thieves stole the body. Unknown thieves stole the body. Well, the answer to that is simple. The tomb was sealed and Roman guards were all around the tomb. It was their chief goal to to keep the tomb secure. Understand this, folks. If they allowed somebody to take the body, it would be death to them if they allowed that to happen. You would at least fight for your life, wouldn't you? If thieves came to do that, that did not happen. No, thieves did not come and take it. You're in uh, Matthew 28. Look with me over to chapter 27 again. Matthew 27 and verse 62. It says, Now the next day that followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate. This is very interesting. This is before Jesus came back from the dead. See, what he had said and the way he was and the ministry of Jesus, there's some of his truth that had stuck in their heads. Now the next day that followed of the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together into Pilate saying, Sir, we remember that that, uh, that, that deceiver said... While he was yet alive, after three days, I will rise again. Command, therefore, the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away. We'll get to them in just a minute, by the way. And say unto the people, he is risen from the dead, so that the last heir shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, you have a watch, go your way. Okay. Go ahead, take care of that. Make it as sure as you can. These are Roman soldiers, okay? They knew what they were doing. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. Jesus' body is in the grave. The stone is there. The soldiers sealed the stone, and I'm not sure of all the details of that, but I know it to be true. And then the soldiers stood guard during this time. Let's move on to a fourth objection. The religious leaders, now this one is really stretching it. The religious leaders stole Jesus' body to produce it later. Now, folks, listen. If the religious leaders had taken Jesus' body, they would have certainly produced it right away to stop the rumors of his resurrection. What, what, it, it would be like shooting yourself in the foot to go hide the body somewhere. No, they would, they would say, here's the body. He didn't come back from the dead. Here it is. We have it, right? They didn't do that because they couldn't do that because he was alive. Let's look at another. The disciple, excuse me, the disciples stole Jesus' body. The disciple, uh, his disciples stole it. Well, here's the answer to that. After the resurrection, the disciples were ready to die for their faith. Now think about it. Most of them, in fact, did die for their faith. Stealing Jesus' dead body would have admitted to them that their faith was meaningless. Do you understand how this works? Why would they steal the body and then be willing to be brutally martyred for what they knew was a lie? That makes no sense whatsoever. Who in the world would die for a lie they told? Makes no sense. It would be meaningless. Their faith would be meaningless. There is no way they would have been martyred for a lie. And yet many of them were. Turn with me to Acts chapter 1. 
the book of Acts chapter 1. Here's what Luke says in Acts chapter 1. It says in verse 3, talking about Jesus after his resurrection, it says this, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, which was his death, by many infallible proofs. What is an infallible proof? You can't prove it wrong. It is so solid a proof that no objection will overturn it. That's what an infallible, it's indisputable. Well, look at this, read on. Being seen of them 40 days, 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Look, we're not even going to look at all the scriptures today where Jesus, after his resurrection, he was interchanging with his disciples. He was spending time with them. Uh, he, was, he even uh, uh, cooked for them on, on the beach one day. He made fish. He, he ate before them. They touched him. He touched them, okay? There's no question he literally came back from the dead. He's alive. He's alive. Speaking the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. I got a question for you today. Instead of, instead of us coming up with foolish reasons that are lame at best on why Jesus didn't come back from the dead, why don't we do this instead? Why not just believe the record of the disciples? It's a true one. It's an indisputable fact that Jesus came back from the dead. They all say he really did come back from the dead. They, are, they were all willing to die for them, and almost all of them did get martyred for their faith. What, what in the world could cause them to be martyred? That many men. The only way is if it was a fact. Can I tell you this as a believer? Folks, the Bible tells us we as believers should not fear death. Why? Because we have everlasting life. And Jesus is alive and he proves there's life after death and it proves everything he said to be true because he came back from the dead. So that leads us to our sixth point today, and it is this. The fact is simple. Jesus Christ literally and physically did come back from the dead, and if he did, then man is accountable to respond to him. Oh, wait. That's where the rub is. That's where the rub is. Do you see the problem here, folks? Listen, if you reject Jesus Christ, you have to reject his claims. He said he would come back from the dead, and he did. Jesus coming back from the dead proves that there is life after death, which brings us to this point. The resurrection tells us that there is life after death. And if there's life after death... Jesus talked about heaven, and he also talked about hell. Everybody goes to either heaven or hell. God does not want us to go to hell. That is why he sent Jesus into the world. Turn with me. You're in the book of Acts. Turn with me over to chapter 17. Chapter 17. The message of those early disciples, the apostles, it always included the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay? This is, what they this is what they staked their message on. This is the thing that gave them the, the, the boldness because they knew what they had was the truth. Folks, the days in which we live, if you have trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, can I tell you this, folks? This is the day to be bold with your faith. Amen. Jesus is coming. We don't, we don't set dates because we can't because he did not give us a date. 
But with everything going on in the world, lining up perfectly with what God has spoken to us thousands of years ago, we know Jesus is coming soon, and we do not, people, we do not want people to get left when he comes to take his church out of the world. We don't want you, you to go through what's called the seven-year tribulation period, which will be the worst period in history. How far back? All the way back to the garden, folks. Jesus said it will be the worst time that there has ever been or ever will be on planet Earth. We don't want you to go through it. Not only that, but if you die without Jesus Christ, you'll spend forever separated from God in a literal hell. We need to boldly proclaim it. Is everybody going to believe it? No. Is, are the majority of people going to believe it? No. <laughs> but they didn't in the disciples, the early disciples, they didn't, they didn't all believe it in their day. But it's the truth nonetheless. Acts 17, verse 31. Because he hath appointed a day. Do you see that? Jesus has appointed a day. God has appointed a day. This is coming. It is inescapable. Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men. In other words, how do we know that that is really going to happen? Here you go. In that he hath raised him from the dead. There it is. The resurrection proves that the judgment of God is sure, that Jesus Christ is the Savior, and that you need him. So, the fact is simple. Jesus Christ literally and physically did come back from the dead, which means that there is life from, uh, after death, but also Jesus Christ did pay the penalty for our sins and satisfied God's demands. Turn with me over to the book of Romans. That's one book to your right. Romans chapter 4. I want you to listen carefully today. Maybe you came and Maybe you came as a skeptic. I hope I didn't insult you by what I covered, but at the same time, I did give you the truth, and hopefully you see it. Maybe you're somebody who is held to the swoon theory. I hope you see by now how foolish that is, okay? Or one of these other reasons. I hope you see by now that it, they just don't hold water. Jesus is alive, okay? In Romans chapter 4 and verse 23, it says this, Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who, Jesus, was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore... Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, okay? Perhaps you're here today and you don't know where you're going when you die. Did you know today what I'm about to share with you can get your entire eternity settled? Right now, listen carefully. I'm going to share with you how you can be absolutely 100% sure of going to heaven when you die. I'd like to illustrate it for you. Let my left hand represent you and me, and we're going to let this wallet represent our sin. We even put it on there in case we forget what it is, okay? Here we are. Here's our sin. We are all, including me, we are all sinners. But the Bible says this, even though we're sinners, God loves us. He hates our sin. He loves us. God wants us to live with him forever in heaven, but we have a problem. Our sin separates us from him. You cannot get to heaven with any sin whatsoever. Why? Heaven will be sinless, therefore no sin can dwell there. Now, most people think, okay, I know what I'm going to do. See, you have to be rid of your sin but we've got it. What are we going to do with it? 
Most people say, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll, I'll be good. I'll try to be good. I'll behave myself. I'll, I'll, I'll turn from all my sin. I'll promise God I'm going to repent of all my sin. I hate the, the term because it's misused. Okay? Repent doesn't necessarily mean, as a matter of fact, it usually doesn't mean in the Bible, turn from sin or be sorry for sin. It means to have a change of mind, a change in your thinking. But people say, well, I'll turn from all my sin. I'll, I'll promise God I'm going to live a better life. Please, God, you know, I won't do it anymore. Well, that doesn't take away sin. There's only one payment for sin. The Bible says it's death. Not only physical death, but spiritual death. Being separated from God forever in a literal hell. That's the payment. Now look up here. Look up here. Because there's nothing we can do, because this is the reality. You got to be perfect to get into heaven. Who is? No one. So what are you going to do? If you die with your sin, you'll be lost forever. God doesn't want that for you or me. And so what did he do? Here's what he did. God himself took on flesh. And that person was Jesus Christ. This hand represents him, the sinless son of God. And when Jesus went to the cross, Jesus took all of our sin, past, present, and future. He took it all, and he paid for it when he died on the cross. He suffered the death you and I deserve to suffer. Jesus paid for our sin. He said when he died on the cross, it is finished. That means paid in full. And he died and was buried. Three days later, he came back from the dead. And the Bible says this, if you will believe, that's all. If you will believe that he did that for you, he will give you everlasting life. Okay? We, we oftentimes uh, quote John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, a few weeks ago here in church, I asked you, said, how many of you got saved on John 3.16? Now, now, there's a context of John 3.16. It isn't just believing the verse and not understanding what it's talking about. You have to understand what it's talking about. But I asked how many of you got saved on John 3.16. Dozens of hands went up. Recently, we had one of our men in our church uh, talk to somebody locally here, and they were talking about the issue of how to be saved and that it's just by faith. The man in our church was saying it's just by faith. This other person was saying, no, you have to repent of your sin. They don't even know what it means, and they haven't done it themselves, but that's what we say, or that's what people say. They don't know what it's talking about. And, and, our, and our guy in our church said this. He said, let me ask you a question. Can a person get saved on John 3.16? You know what they told him? No. No. Well, friend, if that's so, then Jesus misled Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Did you know, did you know in the gospel of John, not one verse in the gospel of John has the word repent? Did you know that? Not one verse. And yet the gospel of John is God's heaven track to humanity. The gospel of John was written so that people would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing they might have life through his name, John 20, 31. And yet not one time does it say that. Now, listen, you're not going to put your faith in Christ unless you know you're a sinner and you can't earn your salvation. But once you understand you can't earn your salvation by your works and that you're lost and you need a Savior, you know what you've done? You've repented. You've had a change in a mind. You understand your predicament. And when you believe that Jesus has paid for all your sins, God gives you as a gift everlasting life. Everlasting. He'll never lose you. He'll never cast you out. You're saved forever. Why? Because that's what the Bible says, everlasting life, the word everlasting. Anybody knows what everlasting means. Everlasting. You, it lasts forever. That's what Jesus gives when you put your faith in him. And this is what he's saying. So Jesus Christ did pay 
the penalty for our sins. And he satisfies God's demand. And you notice this, verse 25, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Because God raised Jesus from the dead, that was God the Father saying, my son's payment is sufficient for your sin. And I will raise him from the dead. And that's what he did. And all God's asking us to do is to believe that Jesus has paid for our sins, that he was buried, and that he rose from the grave. And when you put your faith in him as your Savior, God gives you everlasting life. Friends, and here's our last point today, all that is left for us to do is believe. That's it. That's it. We don't have to go to church. No, not to go to heaven. You don't have to go to church to go to heaven. Did you know that? Hope you know that. You don't have to give money. No, you don't have to be good. Nobody's good. The Bible says there's none righteous. No, not one. You don't have to get water baptized. No, none of those things will get you to heaven. They're good things to do. They're good things for Christians to do. But they will not save you. Only Jesus Christ, the one and only Savior, can save you. One last passage in Romans chapter 11, or not Romans, John chapter 11. Turn there with me. This is wonderful. And again, here you go again, this issue of believing. It's what it's all about. John chapter 11 and verse 25 This is at the raising of Lazarus, who had been dead for several days, and he stinketh. John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. The question of the day. Believest thou this? Folks, we have covered a lot of ground today. I've shown you the, 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 uh, the accurate record of Scripture. There's no question Jesus died. There's no question he came back from the dead. I have a question for you. Do you believe he made that payment for your sin. Do you believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven? Have you put your faith in him? I hope you have, because he is the only way. Well, I, I think I also have to, to live right, do this and do that. Listen, it's good for Christians to live right and do this and that. We believe in that in our church. But friend, if you are trusting in you living right, then you're not trusting in Christ. You're trusting in you the way you live. You're saying, I will take the responsibility of getting to heaven upon myself by the way I live. It's not of works, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Jesus is a perfect, competent Savior. You are not, neither am I. That's why he came. Trust him. Would you do that today? Let's all bow in prayer, shall we? Today, as we close, with please, with every head, every head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around. Today, you can know for sure before you ever get up that you're going to heaven. Absolutely guaranteed, based on the Bible itself. The Bible says, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Would you trust Christ today as your Savior? In the quietness of your mind, God knows your thoughts. Now, there is no formal prayer or some formula that you have to repeat after me. Or No, friend, between you and God, get it settled. The best you know how trust in Jesus Christ. He knows your thoughts. You can't make a mistake. Would you do that right now between you and God? Would you put your faith, your trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior? If you'll do that, he will save you. He'll give you everlasting life, and you can know for sure you're going to heaven based on his promise, not my words. 
his promise. Would you trust Christ? Now, if that's made sense to you today and today, you've never understood it until today, and today you put your trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, would you let me know that? Uh, you, know, you don't have to raise your hand, but I'd like to pray for you. I won't embarrass you or have you stand up or come up front here. Raising your hand doesn't save you. It just lets me know that it made sense to you today, and today you trusted Christ. I'd love to, to know that and to pray for you. Is there anybody here today who would say, yes, would you pray for me? Today I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else? You can put them down, your hands. Anyone else? Pray for me. Today I trusted Christ. Would you pray for me? I'd love to pray for you. Is there anyone else? Pray for me. Today I trusted Christ. Slip it up, put it down. Obviously, you don't have to raise your hand to get to heaven. It's only faith in Christ that will save you, but so glad that you understood it today and you trusted Christ. Father, we rejoice with these who indicated today that they trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. We know, Father, that anyone who does, you save them that moment, and you save them forever. They are eternally secure in Christ because he is the everlasting Savior, and his payment for sin was complete and sufficient. Thank you, Father. Please bless them. Father, uh, start working in their lives. I pray they would start coming and learning the Word of God and growing in Christ, knowing, Father, that the Word of God gives the answers, all the answers we need to life and living, and that they would grow. And Father, we thank you that we are secure in Christ, and we thank you that we have a living Savior and because he's eternal and has conquered death and offers life, we know that when we trust him, we have everlasting life and will never be separated from you again. We thank you for it, Father. And thank you for the fact that Jesus is coming soon. We do not know when, but we believe with all of our hearts it could take place at any moment. Thank you, Father, for the great promise of that. Father, we pray for a good afternoon. Um, please bless each one. We thank you for everybody who's come today and all those who work so hard to make today the blessing that it is. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, friends, that concludes this edition of Voice of Assurance. Thanks so much for listening. And would you share this ministry with a friend? To contact us or learn more about our ministry, please visit www.northlandchurch.com Your prayers and support for this ministry are greatly appreciated. Thank you so much and God bless you.